The Phantom Coach by Amelia Edwards The circumstances I'm about to relate to you have truth to recommend them. They happen to myself, and my recollection of them is as vivid as if they had taken place only yesterday. Twenty years, however, have gone by since that night. During those twenty years, I have told the story to but one other person. I tell it now with a reluctance which I find difficult to overcome. All I entreat, meanwhile, is that you will abstain from forcing your own conclusions upon me. I want nothing explained away. I desire no arguments. My mind on this subject is quite made up, and having the testimony of my own senses to rely on, I prefer to abide by it. Well, it was just twenty years ago, and within a day or two of the end of the grouse season. I had been out all day with my gun, and had had no sport to speak of. The wind was due east, the month December, the place a bleak, wide moor in the far north of England, and I had lost my way. It was not a pleasant place in which to lose one's way, with the first feathery flakes of a coming snowstorm just fluttering down upon the heather, and the leaden evening closing in all around. I shaded my eyes with my hand, and stared anxiously into the gathering darkness, where the purple moorland melted into a range of low hills some ten or twelve miles distant. Not the faintest smoke wreath, not the tiniest cultivated patch or fence or sheep track met my eyes in any direction. There was nothing for it but to walk on and take my chance at finding what shelter I could, by the way. So I shouldered my gun again and pushed wearily forward, for I had been on foot since an hour after daybreak and had eaten nothing since breakfast. Meanwhile the snow began to come down with ominous steadiness, and the wind fell. After this, the cold became more intense, and the night came rapidly up. As for me, my prospects darkened with the darkening sky, and my heart grew heavy as I thought how my young wife was already watching for me through the window of our little inn parlour, and thought of all the suffering in store for her throughout this weary night. We had been married four months, and having spent our autumn in the highlands, were now lodging in a remote little village situated just on the verge of the great English moorlands. We were very much in love and, of course, very happy. This morning, when we parted, she had implored me to return before dusk, and I had promised her that I would. What would I not have given kept my word? Even now, weary as I was, I felt that with a supper, an hour's rest, and a guide, I might still get back to her before midnight, if only guide and shelter could be found. And all this time the snow fell and night thickened. I stopped and shouted every now and then, but my shouts seemed only to make the silence deeper. Then a vague sense of uneasiness came upon me, and I began to remember stories of travellers who had walked on and on in the falling snow until, wearied out, they were fain to lie down and sleep their lives away. Would it be possible, I asked myself, to keep on thus through all the long dark night? Would there not come a time when my limbs must fail and my resolution give way? When I, too, must sleep the sleep of death. Death, I shuddered. How hard to die just now when life lay so bright before me. How hard for my darling whose whole loving heart was given to me, but that thought was not to be borne. To banish it, I shouted again louder and longer and then listened eagerly. Was my shout answered, or did I only fancy that I heard a far-off cry? I hallowed again, and again the echo followed. Then, a wavering speck of light came suddenly out of the dark, shifting, disappearing, growing momentarily near and brighter. Running towards it at full speed, I found myself, to my great joy, face to face with an old man and a lantern. Thank God, was the exclamation that burst involuntarily from my lips. Blinking and frowning, he lifted his lantern and peered in my face. What for? growled he sulkily. Well, for you. I began to fear I should be lost in the snow. Eh, hey, then. Folks do get cast away hereabouts for time to time. And what's to hinder you from being cast away likewise, if the Lord's so minded? If the Lord is so minded that you and I shall be lost together, friend, we must submit, I replied. But I don't mean to be lost without you. How far am I now from dwelling? Oh, a good twenty mile, mere or less. And the nearest village? Nearest village is Wyke, and that's twelve mile to the side. Where do you live, then? Out yonder, said he with a vague jerk of the lantern. You're going home, I presume? Maybe I am? 
then I'm going with you. The old man shook his head and rubbed his nose reflectively with the handle of the lantern. It's near you, he growled. He won't let you in, not he. We'll see about that, I replied briskly. Who is he? Master. Who is the master? That's now to you, was the unceremonious reply. Well, well, you lead the way, and I'll engage that the master shall give me shelter and supper tonight. You can try him, muttered my reluctant guide, and still shaking his head, he hobbled, gnome-like, away through the falling snow. A large mass loomed up presently out of the darkness, and a huge dog rushed out, barking furiously. Is this the house? I asked. Aye, it's Dos. Don't bear. And he fumbled in his pocket for the key. I drew up close behind him, prepared to lose no chance of entrance, and saw in the little circle of light shed by the lantern that the door was heavily studded with iron nails, like the door of a prison. In another minute he had turned the key, and I had pushed past him into the house. Once inside I looked around with curiosity and found myself in a great raftered hall, which served apparently of a variety of uses. One end was piled to the roof with corn like a barn. The other was stored with flour sacks, agricultural implements, casks, and all kinds of miscellaneous lumber, while from the beams overhead hung rows of hams, flitches, and bunches of dried herbs for winter use. In the centre of the floor stood some huge object gauntly dressed in a dingy wrapping cloth and reaching halfway to the rafters. Lifting a corner of this cloth, I saw, to my surprise, a telescope of very considerable size, mounted on a rude, movable platform with four small wheels. The tube was made of painted wood, bound round with bands of metal, rudely fashioned. The speculum, so far as I could estimate its size in the dim light, measured at least fifteen inches in diameter. While I was yet examining the instrument and asking myself whether it was not the work of some self-taught optician, the bell rang sharply. That's for you, said my guide with a malicious grin. Yonder's his room. He pointed to a low black door at the opposite side of the hall. I crossed over, rapped somewhat loudly, and went in without waiting for an invitation. A huge white-haired old man rose from a table covered with books and papers and confronted me sternly. Who are you? said he. How came you here? What do you want? James Murray, barrister at law, on foot across the moor. Meat, drink, and sleep. He bent his bushy brows into a portentous frown. Mine is not a house of entertainment, he said haughtily. Jacob, how dared you admit this stranger? I didn't admit him, grumbled the old man. He followed me over at Moor and shouldered his way in before me. I'm no match for six foot two. And pray, sir, by what right have you forced an entrance into my house? The same by which I should have clung to your boat if I were drowning. The right of self-preservation. Self-preservation? There's an inch of snow on the ground already, I replied briefly, and it would be deep enough to cover my body before daybreak. He strode to the window, pulled aside a heavy black curtain, and looked out. It's true, he said. You can stay, if you choose, till morning. Jacob, serve the supper. With this he waved me to a seat, resumed his own, and became at once absorbed in the studies from which I had disturbed him. I placed my gun in the corner drew a chair to the hearth and examined my quarters at leisure. Smaller and less incongruous in its arrangements than the hall, this room contained nevertheless much to awaken my curiosity. The floor was carpetless. The whitewashed walls were in part scrawled over with strange diagrams, and in others covered with shelves crowded with philosophical instruments, the uses of many of which were unknown to me. On one side of the fireplace stood a bookcase, filled with dingy folios. On the other a small organ, fantastically decorated with painted carvings of medieval saints and devils. Through the half-open door of a cupboard at the farther end of the room, I saw a long array of geological specimens, surgical preparations, crucibles, retorts and jars of chemicals, while on the mantel shelf beside me, amid a number of small objects, stood a model of the solar system, a small galvanic battery, and a microscope. Every chair had its burden, every corner was heaped high with books. The very floor was littered over with maps, casts, papers, tracings, and a learned lumber of all conceivable kinds. I stared about me with an amazement increased by every fresh object upon which my eyes chanced to rest. 
so strange a room I had never seen, yet seemed it stranger still to find such a room in a lone farmhouse amid those wild and solitary moors. Over and over again I looked from my host to his surroundings, and from my surroundings back to my host, asking myself who and what he could be. His head was singularly fine, but it was more the head of a poet than a philosopher, broad in the temples, prominent over the eyes, and clothed with a rough profusion of perfectly white hair. It had all the ideality and much of the ruggedness that characterizes the head of Louis von Beethoven. There were the same deep lines about the mouth and the same stern furrows in the brow. There was the same concentration of expression. While I was yet observing him, the door opened, and Jacob brought in the supper. His master then closed his book, rose, and with more courtesy of manner than he had yet shown, invited me to the table. A dish of ham and eggs, a loaf of brown bread, and a bottle of admirable sherry were placed before me. I have but the homeliest farmhouse fare to offer you, sir, said my entertainer. Your appetite, I trust, will make up for the deficiencies of our larder. I had already fallen upon the viands and now protested with the enthusiasm of a starving sportsman that I had never eaten anything so delicious. He bowed stiffly and sat down to his own supper, which consisted primitively of a jug of milk and a basin of porridge. We ate in silence, and when we had done, Jacob removed the tray. I then drew my chair back to the fireside. My host, somewhat to my surprise, did the same, and turning abruptly towards me, said, Sir, I have lived here in strict retirement for three and twenty years. During that time I have not seen many strange faces, and I have not read a single newspaper. You are the first stranger who has crossed my threshold for more than four years. Will you favour me with a few words of information respecting that outer world from which I have parted company so long? Pray interrogate me, I replied. I am heartily at your service. He bent his head in acknowledgement, leaned forward with his elbows resting on his knees, and his chin supported in the palms of his hands, stared fixedly into the fire, and proceeded to question me. His inquiries related chiefly to scientific matters, with the later progress of which, as applied to the practical purposes of life, he was almost wholly unacquainted. No student of science myself, I replied as well as my slight information permitted. But the task was far from easy, and I was much relieved when, passing from interrogation to discussion, he began pouring forth his own conclusions upon the facts which I had been tempting to place before him. He talked, and I listened spellbound. He talked till I believe he almost forgot my presence, and only thought aloud. I had never heard anything like it then, I have never heard anything like it since. Familiar with all systems of all philosophies, subtle in analysis, bold in generalization, he poured forth his thoughts in an uninterrupted stream, and still leaning forward in the same moody attitude with his eyes fixed upon the fire, wandered from topic to topic from speculation to speculation, like an inspired dreamer, from practical science to mental philosophy, from electricity in the wire to electricity in the nerve, from Watts to Mesmer, from Mesmer to Reichenbach, from Reichenbach to Swedenborg, Spinoza, Condillac, Descartes, Berkeley, Aristotle, Plato, and the Magi and mystics of the East were transitions which, however bewildering in their variety and scope, seemed easy and harmonious upon his lips as sequences in music. By and by, I forget now by what link of conjecture or illustration, he passed onto that field which lies beyond the boundary line of even conjectural philosophy and reaches no man knows whither. He spoke of the soul and its aspirations, of the spirit and its powers, of second sight, prophecy, of those phenomena which, under the names of ghosts, spectres, and supernatural appearances, have been denied by the sceptics and attested by the credulous of all ages. The world, he said, grows hourly more and more sceptical of all that lies beyond its own narrow radius, and our men of science foster the fatal tendency. They condemn as fable all that resists experiment, they reject as false all that cannot be brought to the test of the laboratory or the dissecting room. Against what superstition have they waged so long and obstinate a war as against the belief in apparitions? 
And yet, what superstition has maintained its hold upon the minds of men so long and so firmly? Show me any fact in physics, in history, in archaeology, which is supported by testimony so wide and so various, attested by all races of men, in all ages and in all climates, by the soberest sages of antiquity, by the rudest savage of today, by the Christian, the pagan, the pantheist, the materialist. This phenomenon is treated as a nursery tale by the philosophers of our century. Circumstantial evidence weighs with them as a feather in the balance. The comparison of causes with effects, however valuable in physical science, is put aside as worthless and unreliable. The evidence of a competent witness, however conclusive in a court of justice, counts for nothing. He who pauses before he pronounces is condemned as a trifler. He who believes is a dreamer or a fool. He spoke with bitterness, and having said thus, relapsed for some minutes into silence. Presently, he raised his head from his hands and added, with an altered voice and manner, I, sir, paused, investigated, believed, and was not ashamed to state my convictions to the world. I, too, was branded as a visionary, held up to ridicule by my contemporaries, and hooted from that field of science in which I had laboured with honour during all the best years of my life. These things happened just three and twenty years ago. Since then, I have lived as you see me living now, and the world has forgotten me, as I have forgotten the world. You have my history. It's a very sad one, I murmured, scarcely knowing what to answer. It is a very common one, he replied. I have only suffered for the truth, as many a better and wiser man has suffered before me. He rose, as if desirous of ending the conversation, and went over to the window. It has ceased snowing, he observed, as he dropped the curtain and came back to the fireside. Ceased, I exclaimed, starting eagerly to my feet. Oh, if it were only possible, but no, it's hopeless. Even if I could find my way across the moor, I could not walk twenty miles tonight. Walk twenty miles tonight, repeated my host. What are you thinking of? Of my wife, I implied impatiently, of my young wife, who doesn't know that I've lost my way and who is at this moment breaking her heart with suspense and terror. Where is she? At Dwolding, twenty miles away. At Dwolding, he echoed thoughtfully. Yes, the distance, it is true, is twenty miles, but are you so very anxious to save the next six or eight hours? So very, very anxious that I would give ten guineas at this moment for a guide and a horse? Your wish can be gratified at a less costly rate, said he, smiling. The night mail from the north, which changes horses at Dwolding, passes within five miles of this spot, and will be due at a certain crossroad in about an hour and a quarter. If Jacob were to go with you across the moor and put you into the old coach road, you could find your way, I suppose, to where it joins the new one. Easily, gladly. He smiled again, rang the bell, gave the old servant his directions, and taking a bottle of whiskey and a wine glass from the cupboard in which he kept his chemicals, said, The snow lies deep and it will be difficult walking tonight on the moor. A glass of ishkabar before you start. I would have declined the spirit, but he pressed it on me, and I drank it. It went down my throat like liquid flame and almost took my breath away. It is strong, he said, but it will help to keep out the cold, and now you have no moments to spare. Good night. I thanked him for his hospitality and would have shaken hands, but that he had turned away before I could finish my sentence. In another minute I had traversed the hall. Jacob had locked the outer door behind me, and we were out on the wide white moor. Although the wind had fallen, it was still bitterly cold. Not a star glimmered in the black vault overhead. Not a sound, save the rapid crunching of the snow beneath our feet, disturbed the heavy stillness of the night. Jacob, not too well pleased with his mission, shambled on before in sudden silence, his lantern in his hand and his shadow at his feet. I followed with my gun over my shoulder, as little inclined for conversation as himself. My thoughts were full of my late host. His voice yet rang in my ears, his eloquence yet held my imagination captive. I remember to this day with surprise how my overexcited brain retained whole sentences and parts of sentences, troops of brilliant images and fragments of splendid reasoning in the very words in which he had uttered them. Musing thus over what I had heard, and striving to recall a lost link here and there, I strode on at the heels of my guide, absorbed 
and unobservant. Presently, at the end, as it seemed to me, of only a few minutes, he came to a sudden halt and said, Yon's your road. Keep stone fence on your right hand, and you can't fail of the way. Then this is the old coach road. Aye, it's the old coach road. And how far do I go before I reach the crossroads? Nigh upon three mile. I pulled out my purse, and he became more communicative. The road's a fair road enough, said he, for foot passengers, but it was over steep and narrow for the northern traffic. You'll mind where the parapet's broken away, close to the signpost. It's never been mended since the accident. What accident? He, the night mail pitched right over into yon valley below, a good fifty feet and more, just at the worst bit of the road in the whole county. Horrible. Were many lives lost? All. Fowler were found dead, and two the two died next morning. How long is it since it happened? Just nine year. Near the signpost, you say? I'll bear in mind. Good night. Good night, sir, and thank you. Jacob pocketed his half-crown, made a faint pretense of touching his hat, and trudged back by the way he had come. I watched the light of his lantern till it quite disappeared, and then turned to pursue my way alone. This was no longer matter of the slightest difficulty, for, despite the dead darkness overhead, a line of stone fence showed distinctly enough against the pale gleam of the snow. How silent it seemed now, with only my footsteps to listen to. How silent and how solitary. A strange, disagreeable sense of loneliness stole over me. I walked faster. I hummed a fragment of a tune. I cast up enormous sums in my head and accumulated them at compound interest. I did my best, in short, to forget the startling speculations to which I had been just but listening, and to some extent, I succeeded. Meanwhile, the night air seemed to become colder and colder, and though I walked fast, I found it impossible to keep myself warm. My feet were like ice. I lost sensation in my hands and grasped my gun mechanically. I even breathed with difficulty, as though instead of traversing a quiet north country highway, I was scaling the uppermost heights of some gigantic alp. This last symptom became presently so distressing that I was forced to stop for a few minutes and lean against the stone fence. As I did so, I chanced to look back up the road, and there, to my infinite relief, I saw a distant point of light, like the gleam of an approaching lantern. I at first concluded Jacob had retraced his steps and followed me, but even as the conjecture presented itself, a second light flashed into sight, a light evidently parallel with the first and approaching at the same rate of motion. It needed no second thought to show me that these must be the carriage lamps of some private vehicle, though it seemed strange that any private vehicle should take a road professedly disused and dangerous. There could be no doubt, however, of the fact, for the lamps grew larger and brighter every moment, and I even fancied I could already see the dark outline of the carriage between them. It was coming up very fast and quite noiselessly, the snow being nearly a foot deep under the wheels. And now the body of the vehicle became distinctly visible behind the lamps. It looked strangely lofty. A sudden suspicion flashed upon me. Was it possible that I had passed the crossroads in the dark without observing the signpost, and could this be the very coach which I had come to meet? No need to ask myself that question a second time, for here it came round the bend of the road, guard and driver one outside passenger and four steaming greys, all wrapped in a soft haze of light, through which the lamps blazed out like a pair of fiery meteors. I jumped forward, waved my hat, and shouted. The mail came down at full speed and passed me. For a moment I feared that I had not been seen or heard, but it was only for a moment. The coachman pulled up, the guard, muffled to the eyes in capes and comforters and apparently sound asleep in the rumble, neither answered my hail, nor made the slightest effort to dismount. The outside passenger didn't even turn his head. I opened the door for myself and looked in. There were but three travellers inside, so I stepped in, shut the door, slipped into the vacant corner, and congratulated myself on my good fortune. The atmosphere of the coach seemed, if possible, colder than that of the outer air, and was pervaded by a singularly damp and disagreeable smell. I looked round at my fellow passengers. They were all three men, and all silent. They did not seem to be asleep, but each leaned back in his corner of the vehicle, as if absorbed in his own reflections. I attempted to open a conversation. How intensely cold it is tonight, I said, addressing my opposite neighbour. 
He lifted his head, looked at me, but made no reply. The winter, I added, seems to have begun in earnest. Although the corner in which he sat was so dim that I could distinguish none of his features very clearly, I saw that his eyes were still turned full upon me, and yet he answered never a word. At any other time I should have felt and perhaps expressed some annoyance, but at the moment I felt too ill to do either. The icy coldness of the night air had struck a chill to my very marrow, and the strange smell inside the coach was affecting me with an intolerable nausea. I shivered from head to foot, and turning to my left-hand neighbour, asked if he had any objection to an open window. He neither spoke, nor stirred. I repeated the question somewhat more loudly, but with the same result. Then I lost patience and let the sash down. As I did so, the leather strap broke in my hand, and I observed that the glass was covered with a thick coat of mildew, the accumulation apparently of years. My attention being thus drawn to the condition of the coach, I examined it more narrowly and saw by the uncertain light of the outer lamps that it was in the last stage of dilapidation. Every part of it was not only out of repair, but in a condition of decay. The sashes splintered at a touch, the leather fittings were crusted over with mould and literally rotting from the woodwork. The floor was almost breaking away beneath my feet. The whole machine, in short, was foul with damp and had evidently been dragged from some outhouse in which it had been mouldering away for years to do another day or two of duty on the road. I turned to the third passenger, whom I had not yet addressed, and hazarded one more remark. This coach, I said, is in a deplorable condition. The regular mail, I suppose, is under repair. He moved his head slowly and looked me in the face without speaking a word. I shall never forget that look while I live. I turned cold at heart under it. I turned cold at heart, even now, when I recall it. His eyes glowed with a fiery, unnatural luster. His face was livid as the face of a corpse. His bloodless lips were drawn back as if in the agony of death and showed the gleaming teeth between. The words that I was about to utter died upon my lips and a strange horror, a dreadful horror, came upon me. My sight had by this time become used to the gloom of the coach, and I could see with tolerable distinctness. I turned to my opposite neighbour. He, too, was looking at me, with the same startling pallor in his face, and the same stony glitter in his eyes. I passed my hand across my brow. I turned to the passenger on the seat beside my own and saw, oh heaven, how shall I describe what I saw? I saw that he was no living man that none of them were living men like myself. A pale, phosphorescent light, the light of putrefaction, played upon their awful faces, upon their hair, dank with the dews of the grave, upon their clothes, earth-stained and dropping to pieces, upon their hands, which were as the hands of corpses, long buried. Only their eyes, their terrible eyes, were living and those eyes were all turned menacingly upon me. A shriek of terror, a wild, unintelligible cry for help and mercy burst from my lips as I flung myself against the door and strove in vain to open it. In that single instant, brief and vivid as a landscape beheld in the flash of summer lightning, I saw the moon shining down through a rift of stormy cloud, the ghastly signpost rearing its warning finger by the wayside, the broken parapet, the plunging horses, the black gulf below. Then the coach reels like a ship at sea. Then came a mighty crash, a sense of crushing pain, and then darkness. It seemed as if years had gone by when I awoke one morning from a deep sleep and found my wife watching beside my bedside. I will pass over the scene that ensued and give you, in a half a dozen words, tales she told me with tears of thanksgiving. I had fallen over a precipice close against the junction of the old coach road and the new, and had only been saved from certain death by lighting upon a deep snowdrift that had accumulated at the foot of the rock beneath. In this snowdrift I was discovered at daybreak by a couple of shepherds, who carried me to the nearest shelter and brought a surgeon to my aid. The surgeon found me in a state of raving delirium with a broken arm and a compound fracture of the skull. The letters in my pocket book showed my name and address. My wife was summoned to nurse me, and thanks to my youth and a fine constitution, I came out of danger at last. 
The place of my fall, I need scarcely say, was precisely that at which a frightful accident had happened to the North Mail nine years before. I never told my wife the fearful events which I have just related to you. I told the surgeon who attended me, but he treated the whole adventure as a mere dream born of the fever in my brain. We discussed the question over and over again, until we found that we could discuss it with temper no longer, and then we dropped it. Others may form what conclusions they please. I know that twenty years ago I was the fourth inside passenger in that phantom coach. The Phantom Coach by Amelia Edwards. Amelia Edwards was born in 1831 in London, so another English novelist, another female English novelist. She is one of the oldest so far that we've read, and I think actually you can, you can get that from the descriptions of the coach. It feels very old. I think when we get to people like, you know, the late 1890s and we're getting Bram Stoker and Wilkie Collins and people like that, and Dickens, of course, we're, we're into an age of uh, railways and uh, almost modern inventions, but this one is really old. It takes you right back. This, this stagecoach thundering along remote roads in the wilds of the north of England with passengers outside in the freezing weather goes right back to the sort of Regency period. So we, it, it could even be the 1700s rather than the 1800s. And it's interesting that writers usually draw often draw on images from their youth. So, you know, she was born in 1830, so this might be something she remembered from being a girl. I say in the notes about uh, the story, I think it's a story of three parts. The first part is this trudging across the moors, he's lost in the snow. Very well done, you know, you feel the bleakness and his despair, and then suddenly the pinprick of the lantern. The figure of the um, taciturn servant is a pretty stock character but he's quite funny i think and then we meet this remarkable magus of a man who lives withdrawn from the world that, that has turned its back on his beliefs uh, and he devotes himself he has an interest but really he wants to tell the world what he thinks is going on and he's a very spiritual man and he has no truck with Victorian science, but he, he points back almost to um, Isaac Newton. I know Isaac Newton was a famous scientist, of course, but he was also an alchemist. And this guy seems to be... Very interestingly, you know, somebody was talking to me about how um, our theory of Newtonian physics owes a lot to the occult, because if you think about it, this idea of gravity, which is a mysterious force that acts invisibly on, from one object to another, is a pretty occult idea. Ma magic is absolutely full of stuff like that. And it's difficult to see how th those ideas of Newton's could easily, or I'd rather put it the other way around, it's easy to see how Newton's ideas of physics were drawn by his um, deep immersion in, basically, uh, Renaissance magic. There we go. So that's a, that's a good part. And here's this guy, and he, he turns around pretty quick, and he gives, him some, he gives him his best food while he eats some grim porridge, um, probably with salt rather than sugar. Just saying. And then he's out on the moors again. In fact, those three parts could actually probably belong to three stories. And the only tenuous link between the Magus and our man then getting in the, the horrific coach is that the Magus has said, you know what, mate? He didn't say it like that. You know what, mate? He said, spirits are real, man. And our guy's going, no, no, no. He's a good Victorian. And then what happens. So if you are wandering across a wild moor, and it could be anywhere, let's face it, and it's snowing and you're a bit lost, and especially if you're just married and want to get back to your, your beautiful wife or husband, you be careful of getting any coaches. Now, as to what I'm going to read again, there's no point in me telling you what I'm going to read because I change my mind all the time, except I am going to do an Ambrose Bierce, absolutely, because Anyway, I just am. So I'm going to go upstairs to my cunningly named studio, which is in fact a closet. But you wouldn't know, would you, from the sound, because it's a pretty good closet. Um, and I have to spend an awful lot of time in there. People, people ask what I'm doing in there, but, you know, that's between us 
It's nothing to do with them. It's between us. You know what I'm doing in there. I know what I'm doing in there. And that's all that matters. Okay. Till next week. Take care. Oh, yeah, of course, the plugs, right? Patreon. Oh, it would be so nice. www.patreon.com forward slash B-A-R-C-U-D. Barkid. It's Welsh. I always say that. And uh, there was something else I was going to say. It would be another plug, probably. Another shameless grab but I can't remember so you saved that anyway next week Ambrose Beers absolutely take care